Now, obviously, when purple people f uh, first see me, uh, they don't uh, expect to, well, he's obviously not Filipino. What's he doing in the community? And even walking through Payatas, you get the odd looks from, from everyone around. What's this random white guy doing kicking a ball uh, in the streets? Uh, and so people always ask first, well, why are you here? What are you, what are you doing? Why are you involved in Payatas and the, and the community there? Um, for me, this is why. I get so excited about seeing the potential of children who come from the poorest backgrounds and seeing with a little bit of a tweak, a little bit of a support, how much success they can have. And this has been demonstrated in so many different ways. Uh, the Talent Code is a fantastic book by Daniel Coyle, which talks about how we need the challenge, we need the, the hardship and the struggle to become good at anything. Um, a great example of that is with South American futsal, but with us, um, when we first started in 2011, we uh, were, were using the Barangay basketball court once a week. Um, the, the kids started to play, whoever could join in. And some of the younger kids would watch from the sides. They would look at their older brothers and sisters. They'd run after the balls that flew off by the side. They'd pick them up and bring them back. They were ball boys and ball girls for a short amount of time. Eventually, they finally found the courage to join in. So for example, one girl, she was seven years old uh, when we first started. She had never kicked a ball in her life. She'd never seen football played before in her life. Five years later, she's on the national youth team. She's one of the best girls in her entire age group in the entire country, from whatever background. Most of the, the kids in, in the youth teams as well, uh, and the, the national teams of, of all age groups, are based in the US, they're based in Europe, because that's where the best facilities are. This is one of the girls, part of the team, who comes from one of the poorest communities in the entire country. What I want to show is that this isn't unusual. This is actually quite normal. When we reframe things, when we re understand who an underdog is, when, when we understand the strengths of communities like this, we can understand how we can unlock that potential. So South American futsal, for example, in the 1930s, uh, they invented a five-a-side game, fo uh, football del Celao, uh, which means basically football in a room. Um, it's played five-a-side court, and they produce the best talents in the entire world. If you look at the creative players in, in football, uh, most of them come from South America. Most of the best players, and most of the best players, grew up in poverty. Rivaldo, uh, his teeth fell out as a child because of malnourishment. He's one of the best legendary players from Brazil. Pele, Maradona, um, Ronaldo. There's so many players who come from the slums. This isn't unusual, it's the norm. Across the world, there are these talent hotbeds, these hot spots of talent. Spartak Tennis Club produced more top 20 female tennis players in the world than the entire United States put together. One indoor court produced more than the entire United States put together. Running, Jamaica, 2.6 million people, dominates short running. Kenya, Ethiopia, dominate long distance running. These are not facilities, though, the best facilities in the world. These aren't the wealthiest people in the world. These are dealing with uh, the hardest, the hardest resources, the least amount of uh, capital, run-down facilities in, on the outskirts of a community. So this is what the first rule we can learn from the slums. Change the rules. We often think about these communities as underdog, underdogs. Team Philippines is an underdog. We're a basketball country. We um, play, play with balls with our hands, bouncing the balls, shooting them into hoops. We don't kick them. Team Philippines, our girls, reached the final of the Street Child World Cup. They beat out my own country, England, in the quarterfinals, Mozambique. We beat out El Salvador. We lost 1-0 in the final to Brazil, powerhouse of women's football as well as football in general. The underdog story, possibly the first underdog story, is David and Goliath. Malcolm Gladwell writes a fantastic book called David and Goliath, where he, he tries to reframe how we understand this story. The traditional story goes, Goliath is this giant, is this mountain of a man, this epitome of strength. He challenges the Israelite army and says, any one of you comes here, I dare you to challenge me. I will tear you down, I will break you down, and you have no hope whatsoever. And for many days on end, no one meets this challenge until a poor shepherd boy wanders by and says, all right, then I'll have a go. He walks by, picks up a sling, three stones, knocks him down. What, uh, what Malcolm Gladwell tries to show is that as soon as David stepped onto the battlefield, almost everyone on that field knew what was gonna happen. It wasn't a surprise, because David changed the rules. 
In one-on-one -on -one combat, it's usually fought with swords, spears, hand-to-hand. -hand. David changed the rules. He fought with a sling, distance. You can see from the picture, Goliath has absolutely no way of reaching David. He changed the rules and turned the strengths into weaknesses and turned his own weaknesses, his own physical frailties into strengths. He was faster, more agile. These are the lessons we learned from the slums. When we change the rules, we change expectations. The Pygmalion effect is a fantastic idea of, uh, done by researchers. They found that um, they went to a classroom and they studied a, a bunch of kids in aptitude tests to, to everyone in the class, went to the teachers and said, uh, these are the kids with the most potential in your class. These are the stars. A year later, they go back and sure enough, those kids are now top of the class. They then reveal to the teachers that actually these kids were average. It was the expectations of the teachers that predicted that result. How we treat other people and how other people saw them and expected what they expected from them was actually the driving force to change behind them. The same is true in, in these communities. Our girls, for example, Althea, the seven-year-old girl from before, she's not the only one. Her sister is in the national team. Her cousin was the first one invited to the national team. This isn't an anomaly. This is statistically impossible unless there's something else going on. That's what's going on. Our girls didn't know, for example, that most of the world considers football to be a boys' sport. They just played. And because they just played, because they had no fear, and because they had no preconceptions, no expectations placed on them, they excelled. Uh, in the under-16 boys' league, um, number eight over here, she was a top scorer in the entire league, a year younger than everyone, and scored twice as many as anyone else. Even at that age, the girls can not only be better, but they can reach the national teams and prove everyone wrong. The second need is to find the challenge. The second thing that we learn from these communities is that we need challenge and struggle to improve. What we found with futsal, for example, the reason that South American futsal works is because it's a smaller version, a more concentrated version of football. You have less time on the ball, you have to think faster. You have to find space faster, and you're forced to become better in order to keep up. It's called chunking. You break it down into its smallest part so that you have to work harder in order to get better. And it works. In the same way, if we, when we want to work our muscles, physically this is obvious. If you go to the gym, you work your muscles, they break down and they build back up. The mind is the same. Uh, Kelly McGonigal uh, does a, a fan, uh, writes a fantastic book called The Upside of Stress, where she notes that Stress isn't necessarily a negative thing. How we think about stress determines the outcome from it. We need struggle in order to get better, to improve. So she writes about post-traumatic growth instead of post-traumatic stress. Most of us know about post-traumatic stress, but not many of us know how we can turn that experience, this struggle, into something far more successful, how we can use this in our daily lives. Modern research, too, shows with happiness, gratitude, shows that we cannot live a fulfilled life, eudaimonia, without this struggle. Um, now, one thing that should be pointed out is that you can obviously have far too much. And in the slums, and, and what we talked about in the first half, is this is too much. There's a point at which you break, and so the key is to find the sweet spot, the optimal point for, for learning. So, for example, in our communities, um, there's a, we recently did a, a study on adverse childhood experiences. It's a, it's a simple way to quantify childhood trauma. Ten questions about different types of childhood trauma. In the US, in the first study they did, they found that 6% scored four or more out of the 10 types of childhood trauma. 6% were at risk. What that predicted was a 20-year gap in life expectancy between them and those who had none. Those who would live to 70 years old would live to 50 years old with this childhood trauma. Three times greater risk of heart disease, three times greater risk of diabetes, of cancers, four times greater risk of depression, and 16 times the risk of attempted suicide. Huge numbers that are a bigger factor than almost every other health indicator. This is too much at that stage. In the US, just over one in 20 were at risk in the study. UP Manila did a study in Quezon City and found that 9% were at risk. In the community we work with, with the students we work with, eight in 10 were at risk. It is 10 times greater it is a toxic environment which not only limits the life expectancy, but which cuts everything else down. 
So there's a sweet spot to find. It's trying to find how we can turn this environment and the struggles back down into the sweet spot. If you have too much, your muscles atrophy. Uh, sorry, if you have too little, your muscles atrophy. If you have too much, you can't take, you snap. The muscles snap and they burn out. This is why uh, Friedrich Nietzsche once said, to those human beings who are of any concern to me, I wish suffering, desolation, sickness. Now, I'll be honest, I probably wouldn't want to be Nietzsche's friend. <laughs> but what he's trying to get at is that the only way to grow, the only way to show what he thought was the only thing that matters, that one endures, the only way to show the real meaning and heart of everything is to struggle. And this is why breakthroughs come from the bottom up. The innovations in society come from the grassroots. In sport, we see that Moneyball came from Oakland days, the team with one of the lowest budgets. These innovations don't come from the richest budgets. In medicine, we often see that the vaccines are created by small teams of doctors struggling in their environment, and the Wright brothers were the first to fly. Simon Sinek gives a good example with the Wright brothers of how they were competing against one of the best funded, they were a star team. If you had the best engineers, the best finances, if you picked together the best team who could unlock the secrets of flight, this would be it. They got there first. Why? Because it was their passion and they struggled for it. They labored for it because it was theirs. And so that comes to the third rule. Create something better. If the traditional system doesn't work, make something better. If you can't fit a full side 11, uh, if you can't fit a full 11 aside field in your environment, and obviously you can't in Piatas, make a futsal court. That's what they did in South America, and that created the talent. They created a better system for them, and it works. Education is the example I'll use for this, uh, this rule. In the Philippines, 50% of kids will drop out. 50% of grade one students in public school will drop out and not graduate from high school. It's a huge number. It's much higher in the slums as well. In a class, 60 to 80 kids, teachers are underpaid, overworked, corporal punishment is extremely common. It's a system that's not working. Instead of trying to put kids back into the system, we saw that this isn't gonna work in this community. This isn't what the kids need. The kids don't need to know what the capital of Madagascar is. They don't need to know the square root of 423 in their community. It doesn't add up to what they really need. What we first need is a self-esteem and personal development before the academics can follow. And so we, we took some inspiration from uh, our Buckminster Fuller. He was a 20th century inventor, engineer, fantastic mind, and said that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change them by building a new model that makes the old one obsolete. Every innovation, every technology makes the old one obsolete. That's the success, that's the innovation, and that's what creates the change. So we created the first democratic school in the Philippines. Now what does a democratic school mean? Uh, literally, that the kids and teachers are in charge of everything. Attendance is voluntary. We have one rule. You're free to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't disturb anyone else. If the kid doesn't want to go to class, if he wants to play or read by himself, he can do. If she wants to, to look after her, her sibling, if she wants to to study something else than what the class is doing. If she wants to go to the computer room and study by herself, she can do, as long as she doesn't disturb anyone else. That way, the kids can learn at their own pace, their own, own interests. The school is run by the students and teachers together, meaning that they vote on what's gonna happen with the school, how the school runs. Now, obviously, they can't vote for a budget and say, uh, I'd like to have twice as much money, please. <laughs> they can't vote on the finances, and there are some logistical restrictions. But in terms of how it operates, the children in charge. Sure, you get a bad rule every now and then, but the experience of living with that bad rule and the responsibility and opportunity to change it, you learn far more than studying um, in an abstract way in the traditional system for these kids. This is what we believe with, uh, with charity. This is what we believe with how we should be helping these communities and learning from these communities. They have so much to offer and so much to teachers. We saw a fabulous performance by the Tondo Futcaleros. They're another example of how the best talents in a particular area usually come from the slums. So charity isn't about the handouts. It's not about feeling pity for someone and giving them a piece of clothing or some food for the day. Charity is about changing the game. It's about 
the first rule, change the rules. It's about finding the challenge, finding the sweet spot. And it's about creating something better, a better model that can replace the old failing one. Traditional charity tells a story of a victim, a powerless person from the community. It says, this child is desperate. They have no power. They have no voice. Your $2 a month will save them. We can absolutely help, and our finances are important, but this is backwards. This is backwards because that child does have a voice. They do have power. Their community has so much to teach us that we don't usually get to hear. And that's why, as earlier, the best talents often come from the slums. The best innovations are bottom up. In the same way, we rely on the poor. We rely on these poor communities for everything we do. Our $300 iPhone would cost $3,000 if it wasn't produced in poor communities. Our $100 jacket would cost $1,000 if, if it wasn't produced in poor communities. For our entire lifestyle, we rely on these communities. In Payatas, we rely on the community to deal with the garbage from the city. They deal with the garbage, they recycle, they know and understand the experience better than anyone else. And by doing that, it makes it cheaper for all of us. Our garbage rates would be sky high if it wasn't dealt with by them. Dom Helda Kamara um, once said, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor are hungry, they call me a communist. Now, politics aside, the important thing here is we're looking at the root causes. We're looking to see what the real problem is here. When we go to a community like Payatas, when we base ourselves in a community like that, they have the answers. They understand that experience better than anyone else. Above, we've got the Fair Play Cafe. They understand that healthy food is important for the community. They know better than anyone else what malnourishment does to their children. They just don't have the access to the resources to do it. Electricity is too expensive. A fridge is too expensive. They can't store healthy food. With a small investment, with a small tweak, with a small amount of support, we can create a small cafe where they have access to this. And they innovate and they create new, healthier versions of what else is in the community. This is what we want to do with Team Philippines in the Street Child World Cup. It's an inspirational story of how we can learn from children like Ronalyn and Crystal who are about to speak. It's an inspiring story of how those who we think of as underdogs actually have so much strength and unseen force that we can learn from and that we can harness to solve communities' problems. Not just for us, sorry, not just for them, but for us as well. Economically, our entire system depends on people from poor communities. Every major recession is predicted by rising inequality. And the more inequality grows, the more likely it is that the whole system collapses. With Team Philippines, we want to share these stories of when we care for these children, when we care for these communities, we can change that. We can help them change it too. We can learn and partner with them. They are the experts in the community. And by partnering with them in that, we can create something new, a new model that we can all learn from. So I'd like to thank you all again for coming to the conference. I'm really looking forward now to Ronalyn and Crystal's talks and learning from their experiences. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed everything so far. And again, thank you so much for your, your time and attention.